Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this Science AAAS webinar. My name is Sean Sanders and I'm editor for custom publishing at Science. And I have the honor of moderating today's webinar, Managing Your Mic Microscopy Big Image Data, Challenges, strategy, Strategies, Solutions. Acquiring image, images using modern technology such as light sheet fluorescence, confocal and electron microscopy creates a significant data stream. Add modalities like multi-channel, 3D and time-lapse and managing the data sets generated soon becomes a serious issue. Researchers need more efficient solutions for data storage and processing in terms of both computer hardware and software. In this webinar, our panelists will discuss how these challenges can be addressed, outline systematic approaches to illustrate how microscope users can get greater benefit and more consistent results from big image data experiments, and present examples of successful workflows that they have used. I'm delighted to be joined in the studio today by two top scientists who will share their expertise in this area. Dr. Jason Swedlow from the University of Dundee in Dundee, Scotland, and Dr. Laurent Gelman from the Friedrich Miescher Institute in Basel, Switzerland. A very warm welcome to both of you. Thanks, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very thank you. much. Mm -hmm. Before we get started, I have some information for our audience. Note that you can resize or hide any of the windows in your viewing console. The widgets at the bottom of the console control what you see. Click on these to see the speaker bios or to download a PDF of the slides. Following our guests' presentations, we will have a Q&A session during which they will address questions submitted by our live online viewers. So if you are joining us live, start thinking about some questions now and submit them at any time by typing them into the box on the bottom left of the viewing console and clicking the Submit button. If you can't see this box, click the red Q&A widget and it should appear. Please remember to keep your questions short and concise. That will give them the best chance of being put to the panel. You can also log into your Facebook, Twitter or LinkedIn accounts during the webinar to post updates or send tweets about the event. Just click the relevant widgets at the bottom of the screen. For tweets, you can add the hashtag #ScienceWebinar. Finally, thank you to Zeiss for sponsoring today's webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jason Swedlow. Dr. Swedlow is currently a professor of quantitative cell biology at the University of Dundee. His research interests are the mechanisms and regulation of chromosome segregation during mitotic cell division and the development of software tools for accessing, processing, sharing and publishing large scientific image datasets. Dr. Swedlow is a co-founder of the Open Microscopy Environment, or OME, an international consortium that develops and releases open source software for biological imaging. He also co-founded Glencoe Software Incorporated, which commercializes and customizes OME technology, and Bioimaging UK, a consortium of UK imaging scientists who develop, use, or administer imaging solutions for life sciences research. Welcome, Dr. Swedlow. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here this morning. So um, in my presentation, I talked a little bit about just this problem, the general problem of managing data at the scale that we're now working for in imaging in the life sciences. And so just as a quick outline, I want to you know, just talk, address what is the problem and get some sense of the scale. Um, people often talk about standards, so I want to address that a little bit. I'll talk about two approaches that we've been building in the OME project, uh, one called Bioformats, another called Amero. I'll do a little, wanted to talk a little bit about defining what big data means in the domain that we're now working in and, uh, and how we build those solutions, and then finally finish, finish up with a couple slides on cloud-based solutions and what they mean for our domain. So, you know, initially, you know, just to start out, what is the problem we're working on and, and, what, and, um, and what's its uh, scale and importance? So this slide really illustrates, uh, you, know, is, uh, you know, the kind of problem we're working on. So obviously this is immunofluorescence micrograph, um, three-channel image, uh, DNA in red, microtubules in green, uh, an important mitotic kinase in blue. And certainly the images that we generate um, in the life and biomedical sciences have a certain aesthetic value when we use them. But the reason we do imaging is because we actually are making measurements of cells and tissues and organisms. For example, we can measure the size, and in this case, for example, we can measure molecular concentration, uh, molecular interaction, molecular dynamics, and we can do, you know, we can do so in cells, tissues, and, um, and um, whole living organisms, for example. 
So the reason that this business is getting more and more exciting and is the basis of the data challenge is, in fact, automation means that we don't take just one image that I'm showing you, but a large number of images and, you know, larger and larger samples. And so this idea that I, as a scientist, am going to collect fairly large data sets means that I immediately want to think about, okay, how am I going to uh, process those data sets? Maybe I want to initiate a collaboration with a, with a colleague, you know, in another city, another institution, or another time zone. How do I do that? So these data sets very rapidly become resources that in some way, I, you know, need to be shared and communicated with others. And, in, you know, the, sort of in the, in the limit of that, I might want to actually publish the data um, I collect. How do I do that? So this concept that I'm talking about is obviously um, generic and it occurs effectively throughout all of the life and biomedical sciences. It truly is a ubiquitous problem. And so many of you in the audience will recognize you know, the domains that you work in, maybe in cell biology, maybe in uh, physiology, high content screening, pathology, et cetera. So the problem is, re you know, this problem of very large data sets is, is, uh, is, is extremely common and frankly, you know, is, is really, you know, holding back many of, uh, you know, can hold back the uh, discovery process in all of these different domains. So it's important that we somehow um, think about how to solve these problems and consider data management as a critical um, research problem. So, you know, thinking a little bit about the workflow that we go through in imaging. So, obviously, on the left side of the slide, you have some imaging systems or maybe several um, uh, uh, collecting data uh, around some experiment. You'll go through some series of um, processing uh, steps to, for example, contrast enhancement or, or whatever to, um, to have a final image uh, for analysis. And then, at least in our experience, inevitably there's this sort of divide where a quantitative analysis, measurements made on the objects, the trajectories, their speed, et cetera, are, um, you know, are calculated and then, for example, maybe written down in a spreadsheet or maybe, you know, an R file or something like that. And alternatively, there's some sort of visualization where you actually, you know, create an image or a picture of, of, the, of the image data. We put those together and we publish those in a figure in a paper, and that's really the representation of the, of the scientific result. Now, obviously, that works very well because we've all been doing that now for many years, and it's an extremely powerful way of communicating our results. But one of the challenges is that, in fact, all of these are sort of disparate and distinct data types, and they don't, aren't really um, uh, linked in any way. So if we wanted to go back and search and sort of validate what we had done, uh, measure the workflow, you know, uh, review the workflow that we had used, or in fact, you know, redo the calculations and actually check if we're actually correct, this actually becomes fairly difficult. So many projects, and OME is one of them, uh, you know, want to sort of redraw that uh, diagram. And so the idea is, is that we don't, we're not coming up with new imaging modalities. You've probably heard about that on other science webinars. Nor are we coming up with new analytic tools. But we, what we really want to do is bind these together. And so the idea is, is that, in fact, an analytic tool built um, for one kind of um, imaging modality uh, should be in some way be able to access as many different imaging modalities as possible. And conversely, with all of the new imaging um, systems and technologies that are coming out, as they are developed, they should be able to be accessible from all, by all of the different uh, analytic tools that already exist out there um, uh, in the community. So that's really what you know, this kind of technology that we've been trying to build um, is, uh, is about. And it's really the sort of the holy grail of, of large-scale data management. So let's talk a little bit about you know the uh, the workflow that we do in science and how this how this might have to change as we get into larger and larger data sets. So what I've drawn on the slide is what what we would consider to be the typical workflow. So on the left side, you know, a scientist with his um, uh, working, for example, on his or her computer um, with you know uh, with, and on the right side, you know, the data sets that they've generated off of their microscopes. Uh, scientists uses the application, say, running on their laptop to do um, the analysis, and you know, and basically there's sort of a linear workflow back and forth between the scientists, their tools, and their data. And that's pretty straightforward, and it certainly works fairly well. However, as we collect larger and larger and more complex data sets, we have, you know, there's a much uh, wider range of modalities that we're using, and thus, you know, sort of necessarily a wider range of applications that have to be brought to bear to, to do the analysis and the discovery. And inevitably, we want to share those uh, uh, the results with a, a wider range of people, not just the original scientists, but for example, collaborators, as I mentioned, but even publishing that data and maybe um, um, depositing them in a public repository. So this really broadening um, the, uh, the the scale of what we're doing and the different types of interactions we have to make. And so I've turned this scientific data and you know, sort of a scientific data paradigm. But this concept was actually really developed by Jim Gray and his colleagues at Microsoft. 
Microsoft Research about 10 years ago. They've published several papers on, on this. And they really foresaw everything that we are now um, uh, contending with in, in the world of imaging. They really saw that you know, these applications that you see in the center of the slide would have to not just be, for example, you know, an object identification tool, but it would include databases, et cetera, that could integrate all of that data and then make it available to the various entities you see on this slide. So, you know, if you think about what you, the various uh, technologies that you have to bring to bear to make that happen, you know, the, you know, there are some things that are fairly obvious, and I will allege our quote, you know, I mean this in really sort of quotations, the easy part of the, the problem, and that is, for example, building data centers or storage mechanisms, et cetera. And this slide is actually from the... Um, uh, the Sanger Center um, in Hingston in the United Kingdom, this is their data center, and obviously not all of us will have such a large facility, but in fact many of us, uh, Laurent's uh, institution, ours at Dundee, you know, now have to build you know, fairly large storage um, solutions uh, for our data. So we know we have to do that, and, and, and you can, and when I say it's easy, I mean you, one can do that, you can buy these technologies off the shelf and install them. So if you do that, then you have, for example, a way to store the data, it's on a, syst on a file system somewhere, but well, that that's just the first part of the problem. And really what one has to think about is the various tools and um, uh, capabilities that to bring to bear to make this data, this data truly scientific and truly shareable. So when people talk about this, they talk about standards. They often say, well, maybe if we just came up with a, a data standard, all of this would be solved. And so I wanted to address that issue. And so you know, here's, here's a question. Should we bring in standards in bioimaging? And so you, know, you have to think about the kind of environment that we're working in. And I, I think Laurent's going to uh, mention some examples of this, but it's a very rapidly um, innovating field, a lot of innovations in both the academic and the commercial sectors, and a wide variety of imaging modalities with lots of different implementations, and you see some of the acronyms there. Um, you know, I, I won't read through all of them, but, you know, there are a lot, and they're increasing all the time, right? Um, there's a lot of commercial vendors. Um, there's uh, many custom implementations in, in just people's own labs. And in fact, in many of the vendors have many different modalities and many different implementations. So that's just on the image acquisition side. On the analysis side, there's lots of different analytic tools, open source, commercial, custom built. And they do lots of different things. They may be scripting frameworks, applications, et cetera. And so, fine, and then, you know, so you have this very sort of broad, diverse um, uh, environment. And in, you know, in the end, we don't yet have a common mechanism or a common place to put all this data, so we don't have some sort of standardization enforced on us. So that's just the, you know, that's the, effectively the environment we're working in. So by contrast, in medical imaging, um, the DICOM standard has been very successful. So um, you know, a lot of people use this. Um, you know, uh, the commercial vendors all support it. They all have their custom versions of DICOM, but at least there's a common framework that they can work with. DICOM has a defined process for updates and changes. Uh, there's a series of meetings, et cetera, that happen. And all of this is very well worked out and demonstrated. And one key point is, is that since medical imaging is focused primarily on patient-based you know, imaging, the data model, effectively the structure of DICOM, is really focused on that clinical patient. And all of that makes sense, and it works extremely well. So why can't we do that in, in imaging, in, bio, in biological imaging? So as I said, one of the challenges is that this is a very rapidly innovating field. So people are coming up with you know, new uh, imaging modalities and reporting them uh, to the community. You know, sort of every few weeks we see new modalities coming online. So, and we don't really then have a time for a long sort of organized um, specification approval process. What that means is any standard we come up with will be obsolete actually pretty quickly. And even if we were able to come up with some sort of standards, they really don't solve the key problems that we have to address. So searching and being able to query the data, integrating different data types, collaborating across many different entities, and building large um, uh, you know, solutions for large distributed data analysis to handle the data set, the size of data that we have. So these are really the problems that we do have to solve. And so it, you know, a stand, I would argue that a standard, you know, a shared standard won't solve that. So in OME and actually in many other applications, and so OME is just one example of a number of different um, uh, projects that are working on this, um, our approach is really to come up in, indeed with some kind of data model, a data specification that we can use um, to uh, track the different data elements that we're interested in, and that's really around the acquisition environment, et cetera. Um, but we notice we don't call that a standard because it actually, you know, it's, it's just a starting point and others can um, extend it in various ways. But we use that specification to build software, and the two I want to talk about today, one is bioformats, which is a um, data translator, and one is a MERO, so a, a data management um, system. 
So Bioformats is a single open source Java library that anybody can use. It reads about 145 different proprietary file formats um, into a common model and then uh, ma and makes those da all those data, those data formats accessible by a wide range of both open source and commercial software. Um, while formats reads data in light, light microscopy, electron microscopy, high content screening, digital pathology, and many others. And so it really is, you know, it, it, we are trying to make it as universal as possible. Bioformats is built from um, submissions from the community, so data sets that the community sends us uh, to, uh, to support, and those file formats are then reverse engineered, and then software is incorporated into bioformats so that those data formats can be read. Omero is a, uh, is a, a full-blown data management system. So on the bottom of the slide, you see lots of different data sources. So there will be the image data itself. There will be uh, um, databases holding the metadata, other data sources holding the analytic data, the search, the search indices, and so on. And Omero is a software application that can run on, on your hardware and then communicate all those different data types out to a series of clients over a standard internet connection. So clearly, this is, this is a scientific software, a piece of software, so we can't specify uh, what kind of um, client application anyone would use. Maybe they use a web page, maybe they use a Java application, or a Python script, and so on. And so Amero has to be able to, you know, a single Amero server has to be able to support all of the, those different client um, connections, and it does. So just a, qu a quick... Um, uh, you know, quick examples here. So a screenshot of a Java client that we call Amero Insight. And sort of moving from left to right, you see file trees and thumbnails and metadata and multidimensional image viewing and analytic results. So all of those things are supported in the client, but the client is pulling those over an internet connection, in this case on hotel Wi-Fi, and this is a screenshot from my laptop connecting back to data, and data sets in Dundee. So that remote connection works. Now, obviously, any kind of um, application has to have a, has to control access to um, the data. So, Amero does that by giving the ability to make some data, for example, private, nobody can see it, or to be able to find um, uh, groups and the permissions within a group, or even make that data public and, and uh, defining what um, um, public users can do. You could take that model and do all sorts of interesting things with it. In this case, we've built a teaching application for digital pathology. This is used at Dundee um, for um, uh, 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 training students there studying histology and pathology. Alternatively, we can make data publication tools. This is a project um, that we've been uh, working on at Dundee with several other collaborators. The URL is um, at the bottom of the slide there, and you can uh, check that out. This is publishing many uh, different, um, in, this in this case, a high content screen, uh, where we publish not only the images themselves, but all of the uh, acquisition metadata, all the experimental metadata, and all of the analytic results, and all the, um, the phenotypic annotations are all available in one single system across a many, many different um, uh, studies online. Because we have bioformats, we can work with many different data types. In this case, this isn't high content screening. These are um, this is uh, the Terra Ocean study, which is a sampling of the the um, a global sampling of the plankton in the in the world's oceans. And so again, we've linked to the image data, the metadata, etc. And again, this is all available from that URL. So what about this 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 term big data? What does that big data really mean? So, um, you know, thinking back, several of us have been in this business for a while. Our imaging facilities, uh, when we just had, you know, fairly uh, traditional, if you will, digital light microscopes, we would be generating between 5, 10, maybe 50 gig gigs, gigabytes of data a day. And we could, you know, those data could be written down, um, say, on the acquisition system, and then maybe transferred from a facility server to a lab server, or maybe uh, transferred to uh, USB drives or, you know, whatever. They really weren't that big, and so size wasn't really a problem. In this case, for example, in this slide, we could transfer that data from the acquisition systems into a, a dedicated repository. But sort of moving down the left side of the slide there, now in high content screening, digital pathology, light sheet imaging, and many others, the data volumes are just too large. So we're, um, um, where we're collecting you know, multiple terabytes a day. And frankly, this data can only be written once. And then once they're written down in the format, whatever they're written in, that's where they'll stay because it's just too expensive to convert the data or transfer it anywhere. And so we have to really change the way the architectures of our applications work, and we have to be able to read the metadata, store that metadata in some sort of database. Because there's so much metadata, we have to have it stored in some sort of coherent way. And then our applications have to be able to pull the pixel data, the image data, out of those uh, native formats as they came off the microscope. And this is what we've been doing with Amero um, uh, recently over the last couple of years, and this works very well. 
Now, taking that concept one step further, if we wanted to build um, large enterprise sol um, solutions, for example, cluster-based analysis tools, um, the idea is, is that you would have, for example, a, re uh, a relational database system that ha holds all the metadata, We've had tabular arrays storing the, um, uh, the analytic results. But we, we, you know, again, we have the data written once in, in the native file formats as, as they come out of the uh, microscope. And what we would then be doing is on some, for example, some uh, distributed system, a cluster-based um, uh, processing system, taking the various analytic tools, and you see some of them here, there are obviously many others, and displaying them on our uh, cluster. And then using Amero, for example, or some other database management system to access the metadata, but um, uh, accessing the files, the, the binary data, the image data, um, uh, using some sort of clustered file system directly from these uh, processing tools. And the point is, is that, you know, this is one way to architect this thing, but, but if we're going to be using, building these big data solutions, we have to have a very flexible um, way of accessing uh, data depending on the architectures and depending on the scale that we have to work on. So what about cloud-based solutions? People talk about this a lot, and there's potentially a lot of power in this. So, you know, are these realistic for these kinds of data? So there's certainly lots of different types of clouds now, and you see some of them named um, there on the slide, many different commercial providers working at different scales and really different types of um, applications. Um, indeed, many of our institutions, and I think in Laurent's institution as well as mine, we've, you know, we've built our own sort of private institutional clouds that we, that, that we, the, that we deploy. And so there's a lot of choices here. But in some sense, many of the challenges are familiar and really haven't changed that much. We have to think about exactly you know, how we transfer data and if we can even move the data at all. Can we access the, the, the data stores? Can we uh, link processing? Um, uh, can we link the necessary processing, et cetera? So, you know, in fact, m many of these um, challenges are similar. But there's some new challenges, especially in some cloud architectures, that we really have to think about. In particular, how data is stored as objects as opposed to files, and frankly, what it costs. And so, redrawing the slide I was just showing you, just using a marrow as an example, of basically all of our different data stores, the database, the search indices, the tabular arrays, um, and um, the, uh, um, the image data stores are now in sort of some sort of cloud provision. You would have a marrow and another um, um, uh, databasing application uh, you know, running in some cloud resource, and obviously all of our analytic tools running in cloud-based resource as well. Now, one trick here is, is that, in fact, now these, these large data stores are, as I said, storing in objects. And one of the key things is that, for example, if you, if you, if you, if you have a, let's say, a four terabyte light sheet image, um, if, if stored on a file system, we'd never actually access the whole data set at one time. We move, we use file pointers to move through the, 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 um, the, that file and pick up, you know, one plane at once or multiple planes at once. We're never looking at the whole um, um, data structure. But in object stores, when we request that, that file, basically the whole file comes across into the application. So suddenly our application has to hold a very large multi-terabyte um, uh, uh, you know, piece of data, and that tends to be very hard. It also um, tends to, so, so basically what that means is we have to reconstruct the applications, um, you know, in this case, for example, bioformats, to be much more aware of these object stores, and at least in the OME project, that's one thing that we're actively doing right now. Finally, the thing, the thing we have to consider is transferring data in these applications and in these cloud-based applications can be expensive for a com you know if you use a commercial provider, and so depending on how you architect these problems, these are actually can be very cost-effective or very expensive. And so again, it takes some expertise to figure out how to do all this. So there's huge opportunities there, but there's definitely some things to think about. So the final slide, just to summarize, uh, you know, uh, you know what I've been telling you today. Jim Gray and his colleagues were, in fact, right. We need databasing um, applications to be able to, to link all the metadata, et cetera. And we need to be able to um, work at a scale that really is something that we haven't thought about before. Um, what we found is common mechanisms for accessing the data, you know, use, using interfaces as a standard as opposed to enforcing a standard. And some examples um, are shown there on the slide that we've been building in OME. But critically, this is a problem that, frankly, today you can't buy an off-the-shelf solution. You can't just, you know, order, you know, issue a PO, no, PO and get the, um, the technology solutions. And thus, the way to, to take these solutions forward is to build communities, um, get example data sets, uh, link up with our users, and really take, bring in all of the different um, uh, uh, kinds of expertise from scientists, engineers, software developers, et cetera, to, to build the solutions that we need. 
And I think what's one of the most exciting things is, is that we have both, you know, in, in this environment now we have academic, we have industrial partners, commercial partners, et cetera, working together to build solutions. So I'll stop there and just thank, at least on our side, everybody who's uh, supported our work, the Wellcome Trust, BBSRC, and several Horizon 2020 grants in Europe. And just a tip of the hat to everybody on the OME project who's been involved. It's a very large project. And um, really, you know, what you've, the, these concepts that, you, that I've been telling you about have been worked through from uh, many different uh, participants. And thanks, John. Thanks for the opportunity to tell you about that work. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Swedlow. Um, our next speaker today is Dr. Laurent Gelman. Dr. Gelman joined the light microscopy facility at the Friedrich Miesche Institute in Basel in 2006, leading the group from 2009 onwards. Since 2011, he has been co-head of the Facility for Advanced Imaging and Microscopy at FMI. One mission of the facility is to establish user-friendly workflows ranging from sample preparation to image acquisition, image processing, and long-term data storage, especially for imaging modalities generating very big data sets or files. Welcome, Dr. Gelman. Thanks a lot, and thanks a lot for the invitation. So on my set today, I will share three very different solutions we uh, set up at the FMI to try to cope with this problem of big data big microscopy data sets or big files. We see obviously the very same uh, issues as everywhere. Um, our users do more quantitative imaging, uh, more live imaging, and these techniques generate uh, much more data, uh, much more files, or so much bigger files than in the past, and we have to cope with that. And I will give you today three examples, one workflow with slide scanning, one workflow with high column screening, and one workflow with 3D electron microscopy. And the reason why I picked up the three examples is because the solutions are very different. And this is a, one of the take home messages, and this is unfortunate, but um, today, if you want to solve that problem, I fear there is no one big magical solution, but every uh, imaging modality requires um, a different workflow. So, we start with slide scanning, where the main challenge is obviously match processing. Um, we often require very high computing power, uh, for example, for image analysis, segmentation with machine learning, and it was very often in the past something limiting for us at the facility, or we were limited by the RAM of the computers when we were running some stitching. Uh, the data transfer is obviously also a very important issue. It's very time consuming uh, to transfer the data from the computers where the image is acquired to the computer where it will be processed and then down to the computer or the disks where it will be stored. Um, file opening and transfer between software is an issue as well. So you may have your data saved in a very nice file format for visualization, but then you need to put those in the software for uh, quantification, and that's not always very easy with such big data. Um, storage is, of course, a problem. We do not generate uh, the same amount of data as with lighted microscopy, for example, which is very scary. But still, we at the FMI get 60 to 80 terabytes a year. So after four or five years, we need to find 0.4 petabytes of tape somewhere uh, to store all this data and to archive it. And finally, because people do a lot of slide scanning, they come with many slides, we have to make sure that they have a very nice workflow that they can really link every image which has been taken, and there are a lot of files uh, with the sample. And for this, you will see we um, used a um, uh, slide annotation um, in an image database. So every user at the FMI who wants to run a microscopy experiment has to submit a request through the intranet. It goes into our project management system, and uh, that system creates automatically a corresponding project in the image database with the very same unique number. And the user at that point opens the database, the image database, and is going to enter information about the samples. And in that case here, one experiment will correspond to one slide. And the type of information which is entered is a lot of metadata information, but also very importantly information about how this sample is going to be stained, uh, like which antibody or which dilution of antibody, which secondary antibody, or any other information if it's not antibodies because the user will go after to uh, the imaging facility, to the um, histology facility, sorry, and, and they will perform the staining for the user based on the information that the user entered in the database. So that's a very critical step. Um, most often, the staining will be done automatically on a Ventana robot, and the histology uh, facility staff will enter 
um, in the experiment in the image database the unique slide ID number which has been generated by the Ventana robot and we'll also import a PDF which is a run report which contains all information about the staining protocol. The user is obviously after uh, notified that the slides have been stained and um, it's going to bring them and load them into the slide scanner. So we have an exoscan set one uh, from size and there the user sitting at the scope can directly import from the database through the CSV file all the names of the different slides and their unique slide ID number into the Zen software. That's very important because uh, we have a unique identification number for each slide. Uh, we don't want any error to happen at that um, stage. And also because the user has already entered all the information and names, he doesn't want to spend time naming again all the files on the slide scanner. So the slides will be scanned, the files will be saved with the very same name as those entered into the database. And uh, we have an automatic RoboCopy script running in the back which copies all the new files uh, to our server. Okay. Um, there, on the server, we have a script running which is going to also match every new file uh, from the slide scanner to an entry in the database, if it exists, and the files will be referenced into the database. There will be a link uh, to that file onto the server, and at that point, I must insist, it's only referenced. It's not in turn I've really entered into the database. And we will have the creation of a small thumbnail which corresponds to the label of the slide for easy browsing and identification. So the image on the, on the server, and the goal of this workflow was uh, to get a big machine where people could really have a lot of CPUs and, and RAM to analyze their data. Typically we use Zen or MATLAB or um, Elastic or Fiji. And um, if the user is happy with the result, um, he or she can uh, really import them into the database to keep them for on a long-term storage solution. And we have um, in the uh, form of the, da in the image database a small button which is keep, and if the user um, clicks on the skip, then the image is this time imported into the database, and that means it's saved actually on a storage place, uh, fast one. it's based on disk, and there we offer 300 terabytes of storage. Um, if the user is not happy with the result of the experiment uh, for any reason, um, he or she doesn't have to take any action. There is a script deleting automatically all the files after 60 days on the server. So for us, this step was very important because um, not every experiment worked, and we could have, of course, imported directly all the files from the slide scanner directly into the database, but we want to make sure that what is in the database is only valuable data and we don't store um, experiments which for some reasons didn't work. So I think with this um, step, the user has to do a very minimal effort, it's just one click, and then in the back, um, the uh, system will take care of uh, the transfer of the, of the data. Finally, 300 terabytes are so not a lot. Um, um, so we have, of course, for very long-term archiving, um, a, a, a backup of different systems. So we are not upgrading or tape system in the beginning of December. We will be able to offer 4.5 petabyte of storage. And these 4.5 petabytes will be also backed up on an additional 4.5 uh, petabytes of tapes. So in that world workflow, the image database plays a very important role uh, to follow up all the, the, the slides and the samples all over the process, from the imaging to the image processing, and the server is also very important. I have here one slide on the, on the server. Actually, I could spend here my 20 minutes because it was a very long adventure to find the right configuration for the server. It's uh, not easy and very far from that. Actually, we, we learned a lot and made also a lot of mistakes, but I mean, so far we're happy. And I'll just give one example. So we have CPUs, we have a big machine, it's 32 CPUs. Um, that's very nice because we run a lot of MATLAB scripts, so we can really parallelize the uh, image processing on the different workers. But for example, if you would be using a lot of Fiji processing, that would be really the wrong configuration. So again, this workflow and this machine and these configurations are very specific to the way we process images and acquire them. Also, 32 CPUs might sound a lot, so in 2014, when we bought the system, we thought, wow, that's a lot, that we are very powerful, we are very strong. And um, well, that's not so much, because uh, in the meantime, high content screening came into play, and then it's again another dimension. So we indeed recently purchased um, CV7000 uh, high content screening system, and that's my second example, second workflow. And again, the challenge here is to review 
enterprises, the hundreds of thousands of images which are generated in a screen. And the solution we have here has not be, been developed by us, but at the University of Zurich in the group of Lucas Speckmans. And we are se setting it up uh, at the FMI uh, with the help of Prisca Liberali, a new group leader at the FMI doing also a lot of high content screening. So the workflow is the following. The users can go to the machine, uh, like for the slide scanner, they can screen the plates. And again, there is a RoboCopy script uh, copying all the files in the back as they are required to the very same server as I described before. And then there will be a pre-processing step run by iBrain. So we use iBrain, it's a piece of software, um, and iBrain is a very user-friendly um, interface and, and, and system to process a very high number of, of pictures. Um, I will show you right now. It is actually, as you can see, it's obvious actually iBrain is based on Cell Provider 1, but it's been extensively modified. Um, it still kept the GUI from a Cell Provider because it's very intuitive and very um, user-friendly, and um, the user can select different modules um, and make a pipeline of image processing. There are a lot of explanations, a lot of indications about the parameters. So non-experienced users can very easily build at that uh, stage a pipeline. And um, what iBrain does actually is more, more than just the pipeline builder. iBrain is going to manage all the uh, computation on the cluster in the back. Okay. And typically we use a 500 to 1000 CPU cluster uh, for this type of analysis. And iBrain is going to take care of all of that. So the user just needs to build a pipeline and say go, and doesn't have to care about all the things going to be done in the back. Okay. So the pre-processed image, so at that stage, usually we do maximum intensity projections. If we acquire Z stacks, we do some stitching, we do some plot overviews. Um, the image will copy it back onto the local server, and the users can uh, browse through them and build and look. For example, here there is a montage with all the wells and see whether everything is fine, whether you should go further into the processing and the data analysis. And in the second step, a new and our second um, pipeline for image processing can be loaded or created. Um, so again, iBrain has all the modules of Cell Profiler 1, but it has also a cell classifier, homemade cell classifier. It has also machine learning modules. It has links to uh, gene annotation libraries and many, many homemade MATLAB modules, which can be developed anytime and added to this library of um, image processing blocks, um, which the user can choose. Um, so again, here we will have um, uh, cluster computation, and um, the results will be copied back on the local server and further archived on the very same tape system which I described before. So it's very easy for the user to build uh, image processing pipeline, but it's also very nice and easy to follow all the processes. Um, iBrain has a very nice web interface, um, which is actually iBrain is a job scheduler for a cluster. And on the left, I blurred them here, but uh, you have a list of projects which have been submitted by different users. And um, on the right, you can see here how what's the completion level of the projects. You know whether something fails, and if some job fails, then iBrain will resubmit them to the cluster. So without having the user to do anything or to see to resubmit things which fail or whatsoever. And um, if it's in the modules, um, you can see also here on the right there are small PDFs which have been created of small um, JPEG images which give you some report as the things are running and done so that the user can already see uh, some preliminary results. So iBrain is very nice, as long as one can, of course, automatically um, process the images. And the third example that we give you today uh, doesn't fall into this category. It's an example with 3D electron microscopy images, and that's exactly uh, the problem we have. We cannot analyze the images manually. So this uh, project started mainly uh, in the group of Rainer Friedrich at the Friedrich Michel Institute um, in Basel. And the goal of that project was to reconstruct the connectum of the zebrafish olfactory bulb. And um, so the image acquisition is done on the facility, and we have two uh, serial black face SEM systems. And the main challenge is the um, image segmentation. There is no, so far for that project, um, algorithm that really um, satisfies us and really clearly to the um, image segmentation and annotation as we would like it to be. So this has to be done manually. That means that for one neuron, when it's on average six hours, of work to really um, segment and annotate. Um, if in your factory bulb you want to get like 1,000 neurons, that's already three years of work uh, without taking any holidays. And of course, you want to have the different data sets. And, um, and also the user can make errors. So you may want to have different people 
doing the same data set to check that the neurons have been traced properly. So that's obviously 25 years of work, um, which cannot be really realistically done in, in the lab like this. And the solution for that was to create um, Ariadne. That's a Swiss company, which has been created actually by a very extremely talented PhD uh, student in the group of Rainer Friedrich at the FMI. And Ariane is going to actually to manage uh, what I call a cluster of annotators by an uh, analogy with uh, cluster computing. So just here we're not speaking of CPUs, but we're really speaking of um, human beings, clusters, which are going to annotate the images. And so Arene, what it does, it trains the annotators, and that's extremely important. And this crowdsourcing uh, workflow, the annotators are really professionals, basically. I can come on this later, but uh, each of them has at least 20 to 40 hours of training. Uh, Arene supervises the quality of the work and the amount of the work by the number of clicks in the software. And obviously, Arene does also all the human resources um, services like working contract and payroll. So Ariane consists in the back, working for the, use, the scientist. Uh, there are 35 annotators. More of the, each of them has more than 1,000 hours of experience, which they make very professionals. Um, they work from home on their PC. Actually, they sit in Hong Kong. And they receive um, a pre-processed small data sets, so, so up to one terabyte. The small data sets are sent by uh, FTP or on hard drives. And if it's bigger than that, they uh, chop the data into small pieces and there is um, kind of a streaming FTP uh, system which has been set so that they get all the time new data sets. Uh, of course, the uh, annotators receive a set of instructions and they send the results so far by email, but soon also by FTP. So you've seen that for uh, three projects, they all fall into the category big data. There is not a very simili similar workflow between all of them. They're all very different. We have to find very different solutions. Um, obviously, what is extremely important for us is to be able to transfer the data between the different software. So when it's been acquired, we want to be able to use our favorite image processing software. And I have to say here a very big thanks to the uh, bioformat team. I mean, we could not just work without it would be impossible. Um, we have to think also whether we didn't need also some new image standards. I mean, a few years ago, when you would buy a system, you would say, ah, oh, can I export my pictures as a TIFF? You say, yeah, yeah, okay, then you know you're on the safe side because you can always import them somewhere else. Now, it doesn't work when we have a huge file scanned on a slide scanner, for example, it creates a more than four uh, gigabyte TIFF file, and then we have problems. So we need to chop it into small pieces, analyze, and then restitch. Uh, we may need a new uh, container format or a new format for the future. Um, image analysis software, uh, the bad experience we made when we bought our cluster or our server was that we didn't have actually any server uh, versions of the software. So either we had to buy one, and that makes the price of the project much higher, or there's just none. And, or we didn't have any floating license. And the whole uh, idea between this remote image processing is that the user work from their laptop and um, directly on the server to not transfer the data anywhere. And so we obviously need in the future, I mean, the manufacturers have to do to divide sy systems with floating licenses. That's absolutely uh, a priority. Uh, what we realized also, uh, together with IT, is that even se setting up a small server um, it's not that trivial. There are many, many details which need to be, to be um, solved, and we made some good and some bad experiences. And um, I think that, I mean, there is no good microscopy facility today without any good IT department. That's just impossible. Okay, there is no way. And, uh, and, uh, and IT infrastructures has to be developed, and I think institutes must hire more IT people, and they must hire at least one person per institute which is really, who's really dedicated to this issue. Um, I mean, this is a 100% job and it's very easy to keep someone 100% busy just with this big data management. And, and finally, uh, we've seen that also too often this is totally underestimated. One is really out to fight and to convince people still that is a very important issue. Um, uh, people buy very expensive microscopes, they generate a lot of data, and there is no infrastructure and no money after to process the data. And I think the funding agencies also have to make much more pressure on the scientists and apply for this uh, funding so that they have really a solution uh, thought in advance to process the data, otherwise that's absolutely useless. All right, so I would like to thank the 
team, uh, my team. I'm co-running uh, the many of the workflows have been uh, done. I mean, not me alone. I'm co-running the team with Christa Genoux, who is responsible for the um, electron microscopy part and is a great partner. Uh, Stephen Bork has helped play a key role in the setting of the uh, workflow for the slide scanning, and Shrod for an Eden works 50% for us and 50% for IT, and has been also very instrumental in all those projects. Um, IT, Dean Flanders is the head of IT. Thanks a lot. They are, they are extremely dedicated, and, and we couldn't live without them. Christo Melani and Roger Schmidt also. Uh, I would like to thank Rainer Friedrich and Adrian Weiner for the uh, Ariadne and the crowdsourcing project. And uh, Prisca Liberali, who is helping us a lot to set up high content screening and high content screening image processing workflows uh, at the Institute, um, as well as Lucas Beckman, uh, who very generously gave us iBrain and allowed us to, to use it and to implement it at the FMI. Okay, so thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Gelman. Um, and thank you to both of our speakers for the fantastic presentation. So we're going to move right on to some questions submitted by our online audience. Just a quick reminder, as always, that those watching live can still submit their questions by typing them into the text box and clicking the Submit button. If you don't see that box, just click the red Q&A icon and it should appear. So uh, the first question I'm going to put, in, put to both of you, and uh, perhaps we'll, we'll start with you, Dr. Swedlow. Um, this viewer says that an optimistic rate for data transmission between scientific institutions is about 10 megabits per second at the moment, um, and possibly less than that in as he calls, less privileged settings. Um, under these circumstances, how realistic is the use of centralized depositories for scientific data, as, as you've both talked about? Yeah, so it's a very, very important question. And so I, the answer is that, uh, you know, I think what we're seeing now is an evolution of these type of repositories. So initially, we want to show that there's value in actually bringing these data sets together in one way. And uh, the, the IDR project I showed you, um, actually, a lot of that data has been transmitted by um, sending disks back and forth between the data sources and to us. And mm -hmm. so we've, we bought a lot of five terabyte disks this summer and we've, we spend a lot of money with FedEx. So, so that, that's, a, that's a much higher bandwidth than your mm -hmm. uh, questioner asks. In the longer, so what, the goal there is to show that actually bringing those data sets together in some way would have some scientific value. I think that's what we have to do first. In the longer term, the question is absolutely correct. What we have to think about are much are applications that can ha handle distributed data sources. So institutions or, or um, you know d different entities would have to have ways of linking those data sets together. And so, that, for example, never can you you know in one image in one display on your laptop see four terabytes of data. That's not the challenge. The challenge is is, is to transmit across the wire. A representation that you can see. So we'd have to have some kind of server rendering application sitting at, say, that person's institution that would to transmit that over the wire. That's the longer term. Mm -hmm. Initially, we would we want to just show that there's there really is value in, in bringing these data sets together. Mm -hmm. That's the first step. Okay. Yeah, also I actually fully support this um, position. Um, we have to send hard drives you know, to Hong Kong so to transfer the data. Yeah. When we do cluster computation, we try to use very local uh, data networks, so um, they are relatively fast, but it's true that it's a limitation. And um, also, obviously, we want also to um, implement more, especially in our database, more plugins so that we can visualize the data while leaving it where it is. So we move it once, once for all, and that's all. And that, that's definitely what's to be added for, clearly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. So, uh, Dr. Gelman, let me come back to something you said at the end of your presentation, or, or during your presentation, you said that there's really no one solution. Um, so, each imaging modality requires a, a unique workflow. Um, so, where, taking that into account, where is there overlap, and how can this overlap be, um, that the commonalities be acknowledged and used? It, it, you know, how much is there? Because that that comment sounds a little bit depressing. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, no, of course, I mean, there are, once you have a very good network, you give a very good network, so if you have a very good wiring in your institute, and if you have a lot of CPU somewhere, it's very it's very nice, but uh, sometimes you need to have, I mean, what, what you need is a lot of flexibility, and so, actually, on the very first example I gave, we um, did a, a server, um, with a lot of CPUs because we wanted to be able to use a lot of CPUs and that's the reason why at that time we didn't go for virtual machines because we thought if we have virtual machines we're a bit blocked, we're not that flexible, we have to fix the number of cores for each machine and then if one day they're all available we cannot use them because uh, a virtual machine is limited. Um, we think maybe slightly differently today, um, and then with IT, we will invest also massively beginning of 2016, and we have actually new infrastructures, and we have a lot of 
virtual machines available of different sizes, uh, but that represents a major uh, investment. And if we need really a very high uh, calculation power, then we will run a cluster between these virtual machines. It will be a cluster of virtual machines. Um, you know, so that, that I think that would be the solution. And that might be the solution where people can have smaller machines with more memory, bigger machines with more CPUs, while at the time having the infrastructure for a lot of computing power. Mm -hmm. that, that was the problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me stay with you for a minute. Um, you also mentioned during your talk um, about it, the, the solutions that you've developed that there's data that's automatically deleted after 60 days. Do you have a sense of how much data is goes through that process and is not actually kept? Huh. We haven't quantified yet. I mean, the workflow is new. We have to see um, how much people keep this data. We, I mean, the, 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 the users have to take action because somehow on purpose, this server, the data on that server, it's, it's a rate six zero, so it's relatively safe, but it's not backed up. Mm -hmm. So uh, we want to make sure that the user at some point asks him or herself, what am I going to do with this data? That, that was the most important thing. And if they want to keep everything because they are very successful in the experiment, that's fine. But we just want to make sure and um, wait maybe one more year to see how much mm -hmm. is really discarded. And we, we hope people will get very reasonable. Mm -hmm. And we hope that's a way to make them think about it. But we have to see whether they, because it's always easy, you know, the may want to, I mean, so far what we see is that people tend to keep everything. Mm -hmm. That's sure. We hope that with this very simple uh, workflow, they, they might be a bit more reasonable sometimes, but mm -hmm. we have to see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was sort of working around to is, you know, human behavior is very different to w what you think about when you, when you build a system. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if people just end up keeping everything. Well, what I told them already, you know what, when I, when I see that, when I do an introduction to microscope, I said today you need to invest as massively in IT infrastructures as the microscope. They're not as expensive. Mm -hmm. So they really have to think about the money which is available. Do they want to invest it in just some tape to uh, store some bad data? Or do they want this half of a million dollars to buy a new microscope? You know, that would be much more sense, you know. So, yeah, you can try to responsibilize people, but with your work. You have to swear, I think the only thing to add, I mean, you know, this is the experience at Dundee and our imaging. So we have a very similar sort of hierarchical storage system. We've been running it now since I think about 2002. Um, and our experience is that uh, the bulk of data, so better than 95% of the data that's, uh, that we collect, um, three months after it's collected, it's never touched again. So it's migrated off to that tape system, and it never, ever is requested to come back onto, uh, onto sort of the online storage. Now, um, you know, you might say, well, gosh, 95% of what we're doing isn't useful, and I think that's, that's the incorrect solution. Mm -hmm. We all know that these experiments are hard. There's many replicates, et cetera. I think what, what is true is, is that you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a min it's a small proportion of data that, uh, that we generate that actually ends up being published, but that's supported by a lot of experience and replicates, et cetera, you know, in building up the experiment. So the, that, that, quote, non-used data actually does have some value. And so, you know, uh, like Laurent, we have a, um, a tape-based uh, archive, ult the ultimate destination of, the, of this um, data is tape. That's very convenient. Data, data sitting on tape doesn't use electricity. It's actually, you know, it's, it's, uh, spa you know it's, it's, its footprint is actually quite small, and so it's quite efficient. Um, so there's a lot of attractions there to having it, you know, in sort of a just-in-case. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to what Lauren said, you know, I th we haven't been able to figure out a way to convince people to, you know, regularly and reliably, uh, shall we say, curate their data or maybe even delete the things that they really don't like. So effectively, we've chosen to just say, okay, just put it on tape. Mm -hmm. But, um, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, these are these are real challenges. I think we also have to remember that we, we live under the um, requirements of our funding bodies who, who, you know, will require us to hold the data relevant to our published uh, experiments for somewhere between, depending on the funding organization, between five and ten years. So that's another driver there. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a couple of questions for you, Dr. Swedla, on uh, Omero. Um, uh, what is the recommended bandwidth needed for effective use of, of Omero for file transfer uh, and processing in the cloud? Uh, processing in the cloud. Um, so I think I think I'd have to ask uh, in reference to what. So let's pretend. Let's think of a couple of use cases. So um, so first of all, that server application. The whole point of that server application, if you want to view data, um, for example, is that uh, that server application is uh, taking the original data and calculating a rendered and thus much smaller version to 
to send over the wire to the clients. So in fact, I use Amero um, quite frequently. You know, when I'm on the road giving talks, you know, this morning, you know, through, you know, so, you know, there's an ocean separating me from the data source and there's, you know, I'll just say, you know, in the hotel I was in, not the greatest Wi-Fi. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that, you know, all of that works. So I think that's not the problem. Now, <clears throat> if we were talking, talking about a, a cloud-based uh, installation, so in, say, one of the large commercial providers, Amazon, Azure, or whatever, and um, we had the kind of scale of data that Laurent was talking about, so you know, multiple terabytes a day, then the requirement would be that, I would ha- that you know, our facility would have to transfer that data to that resource. Um, and I guess the, you know, the question that you know, um, uh, the person would have to ask themselves is do they have that kind of bandwidth? First of all, coming out of their organization, and then second, through whatever network connection they have, you know, to, to you know, to those services, mm-hmm. and you know, it's, it's an extremely important question to ask. As I indicated, you know, I think the sum, the, the data volumes that we were talking about today, you are in the situation where you really have only one chance to write down the data, and the volumes are so large that transferring mm-hmm. it is really a barrier. Mm-hmm. So um, it's a pretty easy calculation to make. You take the size of data that you um, uh, that you have. And you um, and you multiply it or divide it by the transfer rate, and you know that will tell you. And maybe let's just pretend it takes 24 hours to transfer that data from its original acquisition site to its ultimate destination. And I think you know what what you have to do is say, okay, is that 24 hours an important number? Maybe mm-hmm. it took five days to collect the experiment. Maybe it's going to take two months to do the analysis. Mm-hmm. If so, 24 hours isn't that important. Mm-hmm. But you can imagine other cases where it might not be quite important. Right. Mm-hmm. Dr. Gelman, um, I have a question for you. Um, actually, I, I'm going to put this to both of you. We'll start with Dr. Gelman. Um, it's related to this. So as the image size increases or the file size increases uh, for these, these image files, should we be looking at compression to decrease file sizes? And what do you feel is tolerable as far as information loss mm-hmm. in compression? Yeah. So what we do for the high common screening uh, workflow, we uh, convert all the T files as PNGs, so we're used by 50% immediately, and the T files are discarded. Mm-hmm. I mean, and we consider these PNGs as the raw data. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, for slide scanning, um, we do a bit of uh, lossless compression. We have to be very careful because we tried at the very beginning to compress a little bit and, and to lose a little bit, and it was a disaster for the image processing afterwards, the image segmentation. So we tend not to do it or really to use a very uh, lossless compression. That's, that's super important. So I'm not sure we'll go very far mm-hmm. into this direction, but. Dr. Swedler? Yeah, the short answer to the question is, should image compression be considered? The answer is absolutely, it must be considered. Um, and so Laurent's given you a couple of examples. Um, I think one of the challenges in our field, and you know, I think you've been hearing about this, is that there's lots of different domains, lots, lots of different types of imaging applications. So, we, so almost certainly, I think it's fair to say confidently, we, don't, we can't say that there's a single compression strategy or scheme that will work for all cases. Um, Laurent's mentioned a couple. Those are fairly simple to implement. JPEG 2000 can be extremely powerful um, and uh, produce uh, quite satisfactory um, you know, lossy compression in some cases. Certainly the remote sensing field uses that a lot and um, you know, that's quite, that's quite um, successful. I think in our case it's just a, it, it is defined by the outputs that one needs. If you need that resolution and if you, do, if you run an analysis before and after compression and you get two different results, well there's your answer. There's a problem there and you have to mm-hmm. consider that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if you lost information then you should think of the very beginning. If it's fine, if you're fine with losing some information then from the very beginning you should set your microscope differently that you do not acquire all this yeah. information, mm-hmm. maybe. That's, that, that's, that's so exactly. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, well, we're uh, coming to the top of the hour. I'm going to squeeze in a couple more quick questions. Uh, to you, Dr. Swedlow, uh, is it possible to write your own plugins for Bioformat and Omara? Yeah, so they're open source, and so... Uh, by a format side, we love, absolutely love contributions for the community, helping us to cover the different um, readers. And so there's online documentation how to do that. In the case of Amero, uh, Amero has a back end, a, script, a scripting engine that uses Python. It can also use MATLAB, et cetera. So all the processing can be bolted onto Amero quite easily. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, <clears throat> and. Um Sorry, I was just looking for that last question. Um, I'm going to I'm going to actually put a, um, a forward-looking question to you both, just as as a final question, um, and I'm going to combine two questions for that. Uh, how do you think the data landscape is going to look in the future, as far as the size of image data is produced and how it will be hand how it will be handled? 
Um, and do you see any technical, technological advances that are coming down the pike that might change that landscape? So, Dr. Swedlow, can I, I... I have to go first. You have to go first. <laughs> um, yeah, so you know, certainly um, um, you know, compression is an interesting one for sure. And so you know, the automation will get better. And in fact, you know, as we do more and more investigation of biology, we don't want uh, you know, second time scale time lapse. We want millisecond time scale time lapse because there's a lot of biology that happens on that relevant time scale. So though, those, though, you know, we will be increasing our data volumes for sure. And so we need better... Um, uh, better compression. I think one thing that's particularly attractive that isn't uh, yet well implemented, but there, the math is out there, so-called sparse representations of data. So if you, you know, everything that we've talked about, the representations of the data tend to be, frankly, rectangular. So we have a whole bunch, you know, array of pixels, and every pixel there's a piece of data. We don't need all of that data to be stored, and there's sort of sparse representations that uh, can be used. So I think Frankly, bringing in some of the technologies that exist in other fields and bringing them to bear in our field is probably where there will be the, the, the biggest um, opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I agree with you. I'm not really aware, because I'm not coming from IT, of any new revolution like coming very, very soon that's going to make a, a jump in the performances. What we are adding at actually in the coming years, I mean, which we're already doing, is um, we, we see we need to have much more processing power. So, of course, processor will be better, but now our strategy is to um, joint forces, so we uh, set up clusters in Sydney Institute with all the computers and we shall not use at night, for example, and that's our current strategy and it's, it's, it's working. Uh, we, we, we just distribute as much as we can between all the computers in the Institute, all the jobs to try to join forces uh, to get some more computing power, for example. That's mm -hmm. And I, I could just add, you know, these are hard problems and I think what you see certainly in our project what the Lorenz doing and, and many other projects. You know, there's a lot of people working on this. It's a great community of people bringing these tools to bear, bringing them, building them against a variety of problems, making them available. You know, and I think you know that's probably the hope is a really, you know, a really open, smart bunch of people working together. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well. Yeah. Good start. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, we are out of time for this webinar. So, on behalf of myself and our viewing audience, I wanted to thank our speakers for being with us today. Dr. Jason Swedlow from the University of Dundee and Dr. Laurent Gelman from the Friedrich Miescher Institute. Uh, please go to the URL at the bottom of your slide viewer to learn more about products and technologies related to today's webinar and look out for more webinars from science available at webinar.sciencemag.org. This webinar will be made available to view again as an on-demand presentation presentation within about 48 hours from now. We're interested to know what you thought of the webinar. Send us an email at the address now up in your slide viewer, webinar at AAAS.org. Again, thank you so much to our panel for being with thank us you, and uh, to Zeiss for their kind sponsorship of today's educational seminar. Goodbye. <laughs>